on ramps, coming at church Bible study. Gonna uh, get us started here. Um, Miss Jamie will be here momentarily to uh, invite our children. Our upright children, not four-legged, walk-on-all-fours children, to journey. Teenagers are heading to our space, as they know, and then adults, we're going to stay in here and jump into this study tonight. Miss, Miss uh, Jamie will be here in a minute. Should be here in a minute. All right. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Why don't you take a moment as we're waiting on Miss Jamie? Why don't we take a moment and do the following at on ramps? If you're part of the leadership at on ramps, if you're on staff at on ramps, if you're in various teams at on ramps, we often will go through this personal check in. And so I'm going to invite you at your table or across across the table. I'm going to invite you to share one rose, one thorn, and one prayer request. Now listen, if you're sitting at a table by yourself, you've got to talk to somebody at another table. But one rose, one thorn, one prayer request. What do I mean by that? A rose would be to share something that, that kind of felt good today. Something that felt good today. Can you identify something that you experienced today that felt good? That's a rose. I'm going to invite you to share one rose. A thorn. Something that maybe didn't feel so good today. That's a thorn. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't mean it, it may have been uncomfortable for you. It doesn't mean that God isn't at work. It just means it didn't feel comfortable. That's a thorn. And then share a prayer request. So take a moment. One rose, something that felt good today. One thorn, something that maybe didn't feel good. And then one prayer request. Everyone got the assignment? One rose, something you're celebrating that felt good. One thorn, something that maybe was uncomfortable. Share that. And then one way in which the person you're speaking to can pray for you. All right, that's the assignment. Take a moment and do that. One rose, one thorn, one prayer request. All right, let's go. So we'll start studying in a minute.
All right, everybody. Did everyone get a chance to share? Yes? Okay. So um, I'm so glad you all have joined us tonight for Bible study. Welcome those of you that are joining us online tonight. Um, we are starting a new month. It's the month of May. This is our first study uh, in May. And so on ramps as a church this month, we are focusing on the theme of guidance through adversity. Guidance through adversity. So let, let me just ask this question. And I know you don't have a microphone. I will repeat what you say. But can you just share uh, different examples in your life that where when you have experienced adversity? I want to assume that not everybody knows what adversity looks like or feels like or what it even is. And so how would you, could you provide an example of what adversity you have faced in your life? An example of adversity. You say it, I'll repeat it so folks online can hear it. What does adversity look like in life? John, what you got? Oh, oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. So for those of you online, uh, John just shared that adversity in his life, an example was years ago, so he thinks about it, resistance would be his way of defining adversity. And years ago, he was getting ready to buy his first house, was preparing to do that. As he was going through the process to, to, to ready himself to buy the house, someone stole his identity which prevented him from uh, buying the house without, without the trouble. I mean, he, had, he experienced some adversity in that process. It's a great example, resistance. What, what's another form of adversity that you all have faced? Another example. Yeah, Nisha. Okay, great. That's awesome. For those of you online that didn't hear Nisha's um, uh, example, uh, Nisha was recently applying for a job at Fresno Unified, went through the process, got a phone call from Fresno Unified. They said, Nisha, um, everything checks out, but you are two credits short of meeting the requirement. And so um, Nisha needed to you know, find credits. She had school experience. She had gone to, to school. She knew she had credits. The easy thing to do would be to go to the school and just say, school, print out my, my you know, my, uh, um, uh, my record, my academic record. But the school is closed. So there's no way for Nisha to do that. So she was praying, 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 opens a drawer, uh, locates her school records from the school that's closed, and it showed that she not only had the two units needed, she actually had 36 units, 36 credits. So she took that to Frozen Unified. That certainly met the, the requirement. And now, fast forward, she has this new amazing job. So that's amazing. Praise the Lord, Nisha. Love that. That's a great example. Maddie.
Great. Elaine, thank you for sharing that. For those of you that didn't hear that, Elaine is uh, needs to be into new housing by June 7th. Uh, she's facing that adversity, doesn't have answers, is unsure how that's going to work out. Um, but that is the adversity that she's facing. So we'll be praying for her. So let's do this. Let's just pause for a moment. I want to pray for all of us tonight. You all shared roses. You shared thorns. You shared prayer requests. Let me just pray for us now, and then we'll uh, move forward tonight in our study. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for this, the gift of life. We are breathing. And we recognize that our breath in our lungs is a gift from you. So thank you for that. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the gift of life. Father, we celebrate every rose that was shared. You are gracious toward us. Father, we pray now for everything that is adverse in our lives. Things that are uncomfortable things that are unsettling, things that are uncertain. Father, would you meet us? Would you reveal yourself to us through it all? I know many who are looking for housing now. Elaine is one of them. Would you, would you reveal to her? Would you lead her down the path that assures her that she is your daughter, that she knows that, she feels your love, and she, and she is able to observe your provision in her life. God, lead her, guide her, provide for her and her brother. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So guidance through adversity. I mean, isn't that what we really need when we are facing adversity? John talked about uh, his identity being stolen when he was applying for, uh, when he was seeking home ownership. He needed, in that moment, he needed direction. He needed guidance. Nisha shared about needing credits. The school was closed. Didn't know where she was going to be able or how she was going to be able to prove that she had the credits, even though she knew she had the credits. She needed God's guidance. He led her to a drawer. She opened the drawer and found her school academic record. It was everything she needed to get the job, and she's been celebrating and thanking God ever since. Elaine right now is facing housing adversity. She's looking for housing. She needs housing by June 7th. She doesn't have answers. When you're facing adversity of any kind, what you need most is you need guidance. You need the Lord's help. Tonight, uh, and over the course of the rest of this month, as Pastor Eric and perhaps others leads us through Bible study, they'll be unpacking this theme further. Tonight, I just want to introduce it. And I want to introduce it in a way that's very specific. I, I just want to focus on something tonight. This, this theme of, of guidance through adversity comes from the chapters of Isaiah, chapters 28 through 35. So if you're reading right now, I want to encourage all of y'all on ramps to lock into chapters 28 through 35. I want to encourage you to read those on your own time so that you can follow the rest of the congregation this month as we unpack the theme of guidance through adversity. But tonight, I just want to do the following. I want to just focus on chapter 29. Uh, verses 13 through 16. Maddie, I don't know. Um, I know those are online. They probably can't see that. So if you're able to like figure, help us figure that out, that'd be awesome because I don't have a good way to show it. Um, Isaiah chapter 29, verses 13 through 16 uh, says the following. And, and, and let, me just, let me just offer this in terms of context. For those of you that have been attending this study every week, you know that Isaiah, even coming on Saturdays, you know that Isaiah is, is a prophet that has come to deliver a message to the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. And 
Isaiah comes and he delivers this message about their own sin, their own wickedness, the fact that they are going to ultimately uh, be overtaken by not one but two empires. And tonight as we get to the 29th chapter, you're going to hear Isaiah talking more about that. Now the fascinating thing I will say about the people of Judah is that they really don't believe that anything bad is ever going to happen to them because they have Jerusalem in their land. It is the center of Israelite worship. It is where the temple is. They believe that because Jerusalem is within their boundary, that nothing bad will happen to them. They can mistreat the poor. They can, they can engage in all kinds of crazy conduct. I don't know if anybody here has ever taken for granted the fact that you didn't believe that anything was going to happen to you because you knew you were saved or because you knew that you go to church on Sunday. Now, those of you that go to church on Saturday, you're like, well, I don't know about all that. But for Sunday, you know, and so you're like, but listen, I go to church. I know that I can sort of just, you know, I'm, I'm doing my thing but because I go to church. I know that God's going to take care of me. I, I'm doing my part. Judah believes that because Jerusalem is in their land, nothing bad is going to happen to them regardless of any other aspect of their life as a nation. So that's sort of some context. Chapter 29, Isaiah shares God's message, part of it, to the people of Judah, and he's talking about their conduct. Says the following, Isaiah the prophet says, the Lord says, these people, these Judah folks, these Israelites, they come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. I don't know if you know anybody in that situation where they always have the right words, but their conduct, it doesn't match their words. The way that they act, the way they behave, the, 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 the DMs that they send in the middle of the night, that doesn't match what they say when you see them at work, when you see them on the streets. They're these people come near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but, but their hearts are far from me. Let me pause for a second. Those of you online, those of you in person tonight, why is that significant that their hearts are far from God? Their lips are close to God. Their mouth is close to God. Their hearts are far from God. Why is it significant? I wanted to ask you to draw from Scripture tonight and help me teach this lesson. Why is it significant that their hearts are far from God? Why does that matter? Anyone have any idea why that matters? Okay, I like that, Sammy. For those of you online that didn't hear Sammy, Sammy, right? Say, uh, he said basically, I'll summarize here. He said a lot more, but this is in summary. He said, he said their their lips comes out of their mouth is what they know. He said their heart is who they are. I love that. That was really well said. Uh, 
why else is it significant that their heart is far from them? What if it was reversed? What if their heart was close to God, but their lips were far from God? I am just shocked at this group. All these preachers, all these singers, all these, all these, all these verse spitters in this room, and nobody had what why is the heart significant, y'all? Hey, hey, Sus, what you got? Their their heart. Their heart is about love. Their heart's about love. Mom, you were saying something. God's looking for people with a heart for them. You were saying something, sis. Oh, they think they're me just like, okay. So put in the rest. Got it. Yep. The Bible says that it's out of the, the heart. That the mouth speaks, right? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Maddie, someone online has something to share? Love it. Like a vehicle, like an automobile, when you are out of alignment, um, you the, the, the steering of that vehicle is affected and you end up off track. I love that. Love it. So good. Is that Elaine again? Lorraine. Lorraine. Thank you, Lorraine. I love that. Thank you so much. So their hearts are far from me. Let's move on. Their worship of me. This is Isaiah speaking to the people of Israel in the nation of Judah. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they've been taught. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Here is a people. Can you picture this? Can someone paint a picture for me? H how, does, how does worship look for the people of Israel and Judah whose hearts are far from God, but their lips are close to God? They honor me with his lips. They honor me. They come near to me with their mouth. They worship me based on human rules they've been taught. What does worship look like? What can you envision worship looks like for them? Nicole. Entertainment in what way? Oh. People are doing what they feel like is necessary to sort of uh, conform, to, to fit in, to, to abide by certain rules. But God says, but their heart is far from me. Fascinating. Therefore, Isaiah says, once more, I will astound these people. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The, listen to this. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. What's he saying? Somebody interpret those last two lines from me. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Somebody. Okay. Okay. Jesus says that, that the gift God's given you will perish. Somebody else have another way of reading that. Mom says the way they they'll Tasha, you had your hand up. It's good. That's good. So so mom said that their own wisdom. Their own wisdom will perish. Tasha said that basically generation upon generation is learning how to do things a particular way. And over time, the impact, the result of that is that their, their hearts are never really engaged. They, they don't 
they don't follow God with their hearts. And so the wisdom of the wise, so there is a wisdom, right? They think it's wise to pass on all these rules. They think it's wise to sort of say, hey, let me teach the next generation. God says the wisdom of the wise, it'll perish. They think they're so smart, you know, they're like, they're like, here, do it this way. Here, this is what you got to do on Saturday night. This is what you go. This, you know, you got to be here. You just... The intelligence of the intelligent, it'll vanish. Let's move on. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord. Oh, that is wicked. That is wicked that they have these plans and they're hiding them from the Lord. It is their, their, their motivation for, what, for their own worship is so impure from the jump. Like it's not even about God to begin with. This is their plan. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord. Are you for real? Who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who's going to know? Remember, th th these are folks whose mouths come near to God, who's, who honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from it. This is what it looks like. They have hidden plans from the Lord. They do their work in darkness, and they think to themselves, who's ever going to know what, I, what, I, what I've done? Who's going to know what I'm thinking? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. It is so backwards. Shall what is formed, this is a question from God. Shall what is formed, he's talking to the Israelites, talking to them. You're the formed ones. You, you, you are made from clay. Shall what is formed. Say to the one who formed it, that's God. You didn't make me. Can the pot? You all know. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Don't give a microphone to me. All right. Can you know pots? There's a potter. The potter shapes the pot. The pot's made out of clay. It just sits there in a lump, and the potter grabs the lump, works the lump, puts the lump on a wheel, spins the wheel, shapes the thing into a pot. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? This is the condition of the leadership of the people of Judah. God, through the prophet Isaiah, shares this with this nation. Now, I want to go back because there was this interesting, this interesting line about their worship. And I just wanted to take a few minutes tonight, you know, the last 20 minutes or so tonight, to share something that if you have been through and if you, have be, if you are a missional member of on-ramps, you have heard us talk about this in our missional membership exploration conversation. But, but I want to just focus on this because as a church, I want to talk about it so that we are super clear what it means to be part of the church. Because what Isaiah is saying to the people of Judah who believe they can do no wrong because Jerusalem, because they have the center of worship, because they show up on Tuesday nights for Bible study, because they bought their child a Bible when their kid was three. You know what I mean? Like, they just think that there is absolutely nothing that they can do, that they're, that as long as they keep sort of doing, checking some boxes and doing a few things, and they, you know, they, they pray before they, they eat, you know, like, like as long as they do that stuff, there is nothing, nothing else matters. Their worship 
of me is based on merely human rules they've been taught. It is the, it is the way in which they understand their worship of God that causes their mouths to come near to God, their lips to honor God, but their hearts to be far from God. It is based on merely human rules that they form their worship. So I want to take something that uh, Paul Hebert taught. I'm reading a, a new book uh, by a, a former professor of mine. It's called Centered Set Church. Uh, I'm loving the book. Uh, Mark Baker is, is brilliant. I, I just appreciate him so much. Um, and, and so I want to talk to you about these rules because we already talked through what it looks like to be part of the Judean community, the community that we've just learned a little bit about. They were worshiping God. Nicole said that their worship looks like entertainment. They dance, they go through the motions, but their heart is far from God. That kind of way of being the church can be described, or at least it was described, by a scholar named Paul Hebert, described as a bounded set community. Do you realize that we're a community? And we, we get that. We are a community. What you do. If you don't believe it, then, then you must not have had dinner tonight. Because, because someone else prepared that meal for you. Am I right? There are only three people in this room right now who had any direct impact on that dinner. The rest of us, we all just showed up. And at on ramps, they hand out little styrofoam, you know, boxes. I mean, that's how it works, right? Just you show up, and they just—that's where it is. God is like styrofoam from heaven, you know. And 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 and, but but we're a community because what we do impacts everybody else. We 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 live together as as like a society. That's why knowing each other's names is so important. It's, it's, it's why the way that we interact with each other is so important. It's why when I see you, it's important that you feel seen. Did you know that, that, that you can see somebody and, and, and them not feel seen by you? Did you know that you could, that you could be in a room full of people? and still feel totally anonymous. We are a community. Paul Hebert says that these Judeans, they were behaving like a bounded set community. A church is bounded set. What does that mean? L look at this image. You, can you all see this? Look, you see the people in the middle and then you see the, the circle around them. And then you see the people outside the circle. Okay. This is it. This, this is what it looks like to be part of a bounded set community. The, the objective of a bounded set community. Maybe you've been part of a church like this. Maybe you've been part of, of a, maybe your family acts like this. Where it's like, if you do the following things. If you behave in the following ways, if you conduct yourself in the following manner, then you're in. Simple as that. Just do these things. Just dress this way. Just don't make these mistakes. Just If you do all that, you're in. If you, what's that, Sammy? Yeah, yeah, but the community decides that. That's it. If you don't do those things, if you violate those sets of rules, then where are you in the picture, ladies and gentlemen? 
You're all on the outside. You're outside the circle. Bounded set. Now, the crazy thing is that there is a small group of people that usually makes the rules. They decide where the circle goes. So can somebody give me an example? Maybe you are starting to resonate with this. Of an example where there were some rules in your life and you knew that if you, if you did these things, you were going to be in. But there were some other things that you could do that very strangely to you, like you could do them and they actually wouldn't result in you being out. It was like weird stuff. It's like, as long as I do these things, I'm in. Just don't mess up these things. But you could also do some other crazy stuff, and it would not result in you getting kicked out the circle. Can you pick, do you, do you have any experience with that? Man, I remember, listen, I remember growing up in a church where, where you know, you, you, you basically, one of the biggest things was being there every Sunday. If you were there every Sunday, and, and even if you did a little bit more, you're there during the week a little bit, you show up. You tithe, you dress according to the dress code. Now, let me just say this. There was no formal dress code, but there was a dress code. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, no one said this is a dress code, but there was a dress code. All right. Now, listen. You could smoke. Just couldn't do it around people. You know what I'm saying? Just don't do it at the church. You could smoke in the car on the way to the church. You could come in smelling like smoke. You could come in smelling like smoke and Chanel. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like a little Chanel, a little bit of smoke. You know what I mean? Like, but just don't smoke at the church, and you'll be okay. You know, you don't get kicked out for that. You, you could come in, you could come in with a buzz. You can come in with a buzz as long as you did not drink in the sanctuary. You know what I'm saying? Like you could have been drinking right before you got to church. You could have a you could have an open bottle in the car. Just don't come in and drink inside the church, right? It, it was like these weird rules that people put together, and they're like, "Look, if you tithe, if you do this, if you do that, it was fine." But you could do all these other things, and it didn't matter. It's not that any of those rules I just mentioned are right. All I'm saying is every community gets to make up its own rules. Maybe your family's like that. Maybe as long as you show up and help with Christmas dinner, everything's fine. Maybe as long as you call every week, everything's fine. But maybe as long as you hold down a job regularly, everything's fine. But if you don't do those things, all of a sudden, you're kind of on the outs with your family. So this is what a bounded set seeks to do. Now, people who have experienced, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. You've been part of a bounded community before. You know what I'm talking about, bounded church, a bounded family. Okay. Now, many of us go, man, I don't like that. I'm reacting to that. That doesn't feel good. It feels hypocritical. And so what we do is we, we then erase the lines. We just erase them. Oh, no more lines. I don't like lines. We're going to get rid of all the lines. This is called a fuzzy set community. A fuzzy set community community. The funny thing about this is that a fuzzy set community really focuses on making everyone feel like they are part of the community because there are no lines. You are in. Who's in? You. And you and you and you and you. Everybody's in. We're all in. It's fuzzy set. The downside of this is that in a fuzzy set community, you cannot communicate expectations 
to the members of that community. Why? Because everybody is always in. It's fuzzy. Sammy. Right, Sam. That's so right on. That is so right on. And so in a fuzzy community, we go, man, this is great, except there are no expectations. So there's the bounded set community. I don't like that because there's all these weird rules. And you could be, you could have, you could draw near to God with your mouth. You could honor him with your lips, but your heart could be far from God in a bounded set. I don't like that. So we erase all the lines. And we go, all right, forget that, right? Everybody's in, it doesn't matter, whatever, whatever. Let me ask you all this. How do you know who is a Christian? But how do you know who's a Christian, Sammy? Sammy, is she a Christian? How about her? How about him? Her? Here? Him? How do you know? Sammy said, watch their fruit. He said, watch how they live. As Sammy was saying that, I'm repeating this for the folks that are online that couldn't hear Sammy. As Sammy was saying, watch their lives. Watch them when it rains. Watch them when the sun's out. Watch, see if they're the same all the time. He said, that's how you know who's a Christian. At the same time he's saying that, Mama's sitting next to him, and Mama's yelling out, who's the judge? Who is the judge? Because I could watch your life, and on a bad day, oh, you know, I mean, it's fine when it rains, when your umbrella works, but the day you forget your umbrella, the day that the wind blows and it busts your umbrella, the day that the car drives by and splashes you with the puddle, the day in which your heel breaks and you, and you, and you know, and you walk in and kind of limping through the mud. I like, you know, you, you may not act the same. It may be a bad day for you. And if I see you doing that, I might be like, oh, I thought they were Christian, but no, nah, not anymore. Mom was like, who's the judge? So, that, so, so here's, here, here it is. There is this other way to form a community. It's not bounded. It's not fuzzy. It's not bounded. You got to follow these rules. It's not fuzzy. What rules? <laughs> right? It's centered. It's centered. So I want to repeat what Sammy said a minute ago, right? It is a question of direction. It is a question of which way are you going? It is a question of which way are you heading? It's not about fuzzy where... The whole goal is just to be nice to everybody. Because we lose the ability to be a community of truth. When it's just fuzzy. When it's centered. What happens is that we begin to all be focused on the same Truth, the same mission. Let me say it this way. Uh, I is my understanding in Australia. Do you all have a picture of Australia? Lots of land, wide open land, lots of wild creatures that that ranchers. 
in Australia, it is too expensive to build and maintain fences to keep their cattle together. How do you maintain? Cattle's important. That is your livelihood. You do not want to lose your cattle. But it's too expensive to build a fence. Too much land to build a fence. So you know what they do instead of building a fence around? Instead, they dig a well. Because if that cattle decides to roam off where there is no fence, that cattle, that same cattle will always come back because there is water on the land. If we all have something that we are drawn to, you don't need, you don't need the fence. We stay together, don't we? Because we're all pursuing the same thing. We're all drawn to the same source. And so, with a centered approach, this has the greatest potential for profound transformation. See, in the, in the bounded set, there's this thought, this, this myth that everybody's serious about their walk with Jesus over here because there are all these rules. If you do these 24 things, man, I know you're committed. I know you're in. But all it does is it produces people whose mouths draw near to God, whose lips honor God, but whose hearts are far from God. There is this this air of seriousness about the behavior of the church or the community. But truly, a centered set community has the greater potential for facilitating profound transformation. Why is that? Because in order to be part of a centered set community, do you see, I'm going to stand up. Do you see the arrows? I want you to pay attention to the arrows. I do not care who is close to the cross and who's far from the cross. That does not matter. In a bounded set, it totally matters who's close and who's far. In a fuzzy set, nothing matters. In a centered set, the only thing that matters is, is, is what direction you are going, what direction you are moving. Is it possible that you would have a bad day? And on that day, even though, you know, you was, you know, here on Saturday and you was, you were praying and you were feeling, you know, you were feeling like, 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 like super close to Jesus and, 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 and you pray for somebody and somebody said, man, that really helped me. And you were on fire. And then Monday was a bad day for you. Your arrow was pointing toward the center. You have a bad day. I mean, a real bad day. And is it possible that on Monday, your arrow kind of takes a turn? Oh, it's possible for sure. Anybody ever experienced an arrow turning in their lives? My arrow has turned. I'll tell you that. Right? I haven't always been facing. Every day I don't face the middle. Sometimes I'm going toward the center, and some days I kind of get a little bit. Elaine said it earlier, right? She said, she said, a, a vehicle that is out of alignment veers off course. Anybody ever veered off course in their life before? Anybody ever veered off course in their walk with Jesus before? Yes. Monday, my arrow turns a little bit because it was a bad day. My spirit wasn't right. 
I didn't have any peace. Somebody was on my nerves. Somebody called me out of my name in front of, you know, uh, 400 other people. It was a bad day. My arrow turned away from the center. Is it possible in a moment, in an instant, that I can call on Jesus and he can straighten my arrow out? Absolutely. I don't have to worry about where the circle is. Was I in? Did I get kicked out? Am I back in again? It's just a question of what direction you're going. On ramps as a church, and let me just say the church in general, the church has always been about on our best days as the church, we are a centered set community. On our worst days, we are a bounded set or a fuzzy set community. We either have so many rules, can't nobody get in. Right? Or we have no rules and no expectation. And when there are no expectations, no one's committed to anything. It's, it's a big player. It's very different than Jesus saying, sell everything you have. And follow me. Sounds like expectation to me. On our best days, the church on ramps. We are a centered set community. It's it's not a, we're not we're not a community that says are you in are you out are you following the rules today are you not following the rules today did I did I have to go visit you in jail last month but now this month you out it's not about circles not about fences. It's not about in and out. The only question that matters is what direction is your arrow. Now listen, if I see you and I'm watching your fruit and on that rainy day you're having a bad day, how does that change how I respond to you as your brother in Christ, as your sister in Christ? When I see you and you're having that bad day, but we're a centered set community, how does that change how I respond to you if I understand that it's not about this. I'm not like, oh man, I thought they were in, but I can't wait to get back and tell the elders that they are out. <laughs> when they find out what I saw them doing, they are going to be out. But it's about error. How does it change how I respond to you if I come across you on that bad day what do i do as your brother in christ as your sister in christ maddie I love it that for those of you online, Maddie was just sharing that there's a life source that we all come back to. We always know we can come back. It was never a question about being able to come back. I would like for someone to just, could you respond to my question about how it, how it changes as your brother in Christ, as one of the people whose arrow is moving toward the center that day? You notice how I said that day? Because it could just be that day. But I'm moving toward the center of that day. Have you ever had somebody in your life who you did not know was a stranger? They were a stranger to you. And they surprised you with the way in which God used them to bless you. It could just be that day that my arrow is moving in toward Jesus. But when I run into you and your arrow's going the wrong way that day because it's a bad day for you, answer that question for me. Can someone, how does it change how I, who I, how I respond to you? Sammy, I'm going to let Mama go ahead and answer that one. Go ahead, Mom. Yeah. 
That's it. Galatians. Does it, don't you understand, family, now, that, that we were never intended to be this kind of community? If you're this kind of community, then Galatians makes no sense. Why would I ever go to restore anybody? Right? It's just about who's in and who's out, who's left behind and who isn't left behind. Right? We were never intended to be this kind of community. Right? Where it's like anything goes all the time. We were always intended to be this kind of community. Follow me is Jesus' invitation to us all. And if there is a moment or, 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 or a season where my brother or my sister, Galatians' mama was quoting, is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual. Another word for that would just be those of you moving toward, the, toward Jesus. You who are spiritual, restore them. What does restoration look like? Help them to point their arrow to, toward Jesus again. Just help them turn their face to Jesus. Whatever that looks like. Help them remember that he has never left them and he's never forsaken them. Help them remember that they are still a son of God, still a daughter of God, still beloved. Just help them remember what it means to be loved by God and to love Him. Nicole? Yeah. For those of you online, Nicole was sharing that if you see somebody whose arrow is maybe a little bit off center, they're moving in the wrong direction, that we recognize that, 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 that that's not them. Uh, you know, just come to them and say, hey, that's, this is not you at your best, right? Let's, let, let's walk together until we can get back on track. And I would say this. Maybe we recognize that that is not them. But I would also say that who they are in that moment, I recognize that, that even I am them. Can I just say that? That there's stuff in me that on my worst day, but I'm worse than, I'm worse than you. So there, there's no judgment. I just keep it. I just kept it under wraps today. <laughs> I crucified my flesh today. But, but catch me tomorrow, <laughs> right? So, so, so we're listen. We're in this journey together, y'all. Right? We're in this journey together. <laughs> you know, you think I love my kids? I do love my kids because you don't see me yelling at them. You think I love my dog? But I kicked my dog yesterday. I'm telling you, yes, I didn't kick her yesterday. That was just an example. But I have kicked her before on a yesterday. There was a yesterday when I kicked her. It wasn't exactly yesterday, but it was a yesterday. Elaine posted a photo of cute dogs. I'm telling you, you don't want me to take a picture of my dog because, because my dog may not be so well. This dog, as I was taking Pastor Reese to the airport yesterday, in the middle of the day, I come home, this dog had vomited on the stairs. Oh, thanks for that, Sasha. I'll take Pastor Reese, I'll take my wife to the airport, I'll come back and I'll clean up your vomit. I have no idea why you're vomiting on the stairs, but thanks for that. This morning I wake up and I'm laying there, it's like 5.15 a.m., she kind of waking me up. And I'm just breathing the air, and I smell something. I'm like, something's not pure about the air I'm breathing. And I just, and I know it. This dog has pooped somewhere in this house. I go downstairs. Thank you, Sasha. You had diarrhea last night. 
I don't know why you had diarrhea, but you have pooped over, oh, I don't know, a good 30 square feet of our wood floor. I appreciate you, Sasha, so much. That's what I'm going to do at 5.15 a.m. Clean up poop on the floor. And then, and then, and then this dog, after all of that, goes outside today. My father-in-law lets her outside to get her outside because I'm at work. I appreciate it so much. I come home. This dog has hives all over her body because she has run through something again. She's having an allergic reaction. This has happened before. All in like 24 hours. Vomit, diarrhea, allergic reaction. No, there are three different things, Allison. Secretly, <laughs> secretly, I do not take her to the vet. Because there's part of me that just wishes she would. Let's pray. All right. So I am so thankful for the study tonight. Uh, this is about us as a community moving toward Jesus. And uh, I am so thankful for all of you joining us. Um, this is who Honor Amps aspires to be. This is who the church is. And so may we understand our relationship to Jesus in this way. It is a relationship. We are moving toward Jesus. We are seeking. That's movement language, y'all. We're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these other things will be added to us. So, Father, I pray for our community. I pray for each and every one of my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that even through adversity, the guidance of the cross that draws us near, the, the invitation to drink from a well that never runs dry would continue to draw us near, not only with our mouths, our lips, but also our hearts. In the midst of the adversity that we may be facing, I pray, God, that you will draw us, draw us, woo us, invite us, welcome us, Lead us nearer to you, that we may discover how great you are. Father, bless everyone who's here tonight. Bless On Ramps Church. Bless the Lowell neighborhood. Bless the body of Christ in this city. And bless the city of Fresno. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night and God bless you. A whole life giving is my left. Um, you can give there. <laughs> Don't give your whole life giving to Becca, though she'll take it. That's not for her. It's the box and the thing and, and the tablet. Have a wonderful night, everybody. God bless you. Thanks for joining us online.